Hello, I'll try my best to explain about this electromagnetic field tensor. But I'd like to recommend you watching these two other videos first, which is on my channel. Trust me, you'll have a better understanding. So let's start right away. You've seen how this electromagnetic field tensor transforms the four Maxwell's equations into just two equations, right? But where did this tensor come from? It all started from this question. Back in your first ENM course, you were solving these kind of problems, right? Finding the electric potential energy or magnetic field, etc. But these were all time independent problems. How about the time dependent cases then? Our world is not static, time is flowing. Albert Einstein said we aren't living in just space, we are living in space time. You see where I'm trying to get? Electrodynamics must be described with four space time elements, not just three space elements. Okay, so that's why we have created a 4x4 matrix to do some 4D algebra. But again, where did this come from? It came from these three things. Four potential, four gradient, and definitions of electric and magnetic field from electromagnetism. Let's look at the four potential first. Yes, A is the vector potential, as you probably know. It's named four potential, obviously, because it has four elements. The first element is the time component, and the rest are the spatial components. So these are called four space-time components as together. The first element is actually the scalar potential divided by the speed of light, if you didn't know. Also, we've always put the arrow on top of a letter to show that it contains the x, y, and z components, right? So the four potential is pretty much this one. Good to remember. Now let's look at the four gradient. These are the derivatives. d over dx0, d over dx1, d over dx2, d over dx3. More exactly, they're the space-time derivatives. But for those who have watched my other video, Maxwell's equations in tensor notation, might have noticed something. In that video, we had the elements all positive. Why does this first element alone have a negative sign? Take a look carefully. From that other video, they had upper indices. What I'm showing right now have lower indices. So here's some extra knowledge. There are actually two types of vectors. Ones are called contravariant vectors, which are the ordinary vectors we use. They have the upper index. The other ones are called covariant vectors, which are also called dual vectors, and they have the lower index. And the ones with the lower index have the negative sign. This is because of the special relativity, which is another topic, so I'll cover it next time. And another extra extra knowledge, the covariant vectors are the horizontal row vectors, and contravariant vectors are the vertical column vectors in math. But that's not critically important here. Four gradients are the opposite, because here, the lower index indicates the upper index in the denominator, and four gradient with the upper index indicates the lower index in the denominator. This is what we used in the other video. Here, we are going to use this instead, the upper index one. Why though? I'll explain it very soon. But for now, we still gotta investigate this last one. As I mentioned, the arrows on top of E and B mean they're composed of three orthogonal components, right? So the first expression can be written separately as these. Because the del in front of V is the differential operator, so it can be split in three, like here, d over dx, d over dy, d over dz for x, y, and z component. And this A also has the arrow, so it can also split in three. AX, AY, and AZ. Make sense? Now the second expression. This is the curl of A, right? From linear algebra. Curl of A is this. And as you can see, this also has three different components. 
So, so far so good. All right, so before, in the beginning, I brought these three, and then we investigated them for better understanding. Now we are ready to generate that fill tensor. So now, we are going to try to rewrite those six expressions in the green box in terms of the four potential and the four gradient. The first expression. V is the first element of the four potential, right? But we are missing C here because the first element should be v over c. So we gotta multiply this by c in order to replace v with a0. And ax is the a1, right? Then d over dx is the d1, the second element of the 4 gradient. And minus d over dt is the first element, but in here again, we have 1 over c here, but not here. So if we want to replace negative d over dt, we'll have to replace it with cd0. Does it make sense? I just replaced them with 4 potential and 4 gradient. That's it. We do the same thing for the other ones. You can check that out by yourself. Now the magnetic field, same thing. az is the last element here. So it should be a3, and ay corresponds to a2, and d over dy is the d2 here, and d over dz is the d3 here. Because our index number starts from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, right? We do the same thing again for the other ones. Now look, here's a cool thing. It seems we only need two quantities to describe electromagnetism. Space-time and potential. Maybe except speed of light, but I'll show you how to get rid of this. Some of you might have heard your professor saying that potentials are actually the fundamental quantities in electrodynamics, not the field. You heard it right. Potentials are the real fundamental stuffs in nature. Just as you might have also heard that momenta are the real fundamental stuffs in nature, not the energies. Anyway, two quantities to describe something in nature. If you have watched this video, Tensor in General Relativity, you'd probably know what I'm about to suggest. We need a rank 2 tensor. And let's call that electromagnetic field tensor. So, we'll use mu as the row index and nu as a column index, because normally the first index of a tensor corresponds to the row numbers, and the second index corresponds to the column numbers. It's just a convention. You could do the other way, but trust me, almost all books go this way. Anyway, going back to here. I just rewrote the expressions in a nicer way. You see I just moved the speed of light c to the other side. So all the expressions look consistent. And you see how each expression uses two specific numbers interchangeably? Like here we only have 0 and 1s. Here 0, 2, 2, 0, 0, 3, 3, 0, 2, 3, 3, 2, 1, 3, 3, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1. Each has a pair of numbers. By the way, if you noticed, I arranged the second last expression in a way that I have negative by instead of by. I mean, I could have switched these two terms and have a positive sign here, just like the other expressions, right? But you'll know why I wanted just this one to be expressed in the opposite way later, so don't worry. Anyway, this means we could write a generalized expression like this. And this is perfect. This will be the mathematical expression of our rank 2 tensor. And finally, I can explain you why we wanted the contravariant 4 gradient, not the covariant one. We needed an upper index. So we could create a tensor that has two upper indices. So this tensor has two upper indices because we have two upper indices here. You may ask, why not two lower indices? Does it have to be two upper? 
No, you could make a tensor that has two lower indices instead. That's fine. I just prefer to show with upper indices, that's all. And you may also ask, can't it have one upper and one lower? No, and that has a reason. But you'll have to first learn about a mathematical operation called contraction, which I explained in my other video, tensor contraction with indices. I didn't directly explain the reason in that video either, but it might give you an idea. Anyway, let's plot them now. Here I brought our rank 2 tensor template, or the matrix template. First expression had mu as 1 and nu as 0, so that should be f01. Make sense? Where should the element f01 be? Here, right? And f01 was the e sub x over c. The second expression has 0 as mu and 2 as nu. So f02, correct? We've so far filled in the upper half of the matrix. By the way, this was why I wanted the negative by instead of by, so I can have the f13 instead of f31. Otherwise, I would have had the element here or something. It's nice to fill in one part first, right? Okay, so what about the other half of the matrix? Well, you can figure that out on your own, actually. For example, say we want to know f21, just an example. What should this be? d2a1 minus d1a2, right? But isn't this just the negative of d1a2 minus d2a1? So the second term becomes positive and the first becomes negative? And this was for the f12, which was b sub z. So f21 should automatically be minus b sub z, because it's just the minus of f12. Similarly with the other element. So yeah, we are almost there. Now, how about the diagonal ones? Well, let's think about F00. That should be D0A0 minus D0A0. Wait, they're the same. So they'll just cancel each other. We'll get 0. So this way, we can imagine that all diagonal terms should be 0. By the way, if you still want to know what D0A0 was, A0 is scalar potential over C, and D0 is the negative 1 over C, D over DT. So time derivative of the scalar potential, what does this describe? I guess it just describes how the scalar potential changes over time. Nothing really interesting. Anyway, we have successfully derived this tensor by ourselves. Congrats.